Father, thank you for giving us this morning. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, we pray that through our worship to you this morning, the name of Jesus would be magnified and glorified. May he be lifted up and exalted. Thank you for Judge Rene Diaz. Lord, we ask that you would bless him, anoint and fill him with your Holy Spirit as he presents to us not just our own history, but timeless truths from Scripture. Help us to learn and apply those truths to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to say welcome to all of you for our special service. We've done a combined Sunday school. Welcome to all of you that are online and watching and joining us. Um, I'm not going to take much time. I'm just going to introduce Judge Rene Diaz from Wall Builders. Would you come up and... President, begin to uh, share with us what the Lord's put on your heart. Would you all welcome Judge Rene Diaz from Walden. Thanks, Pastor. Thanks, Pastor Sean. Welcome to everyone that's watching on live stream, and welcome to everyone that is here today. My name is Rene Diaz. I'm an attorney. I've been licensed for 30 years. I'm a practicing attorney. I had the honor of being appointed as a judge in the state of Texas by Governor Rick Perry and I served uh, one term there. Ever since then, I've been working with Wall Builders, and uh, Wall Builders is a wonderful organization. How many of you have heard of Wall Builders before today? That's great, we have a few, okay, wonderful. Let's see if, uh, yeah, here's the mission. We are dedicated to presenting America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on our moral, our religious, and our constitutional heritage. This used to be taught in schools and in history books and was pervasive in all of society until several generations ago when it seems to have been forgotten. And I hope to remind you with some interesting stories and some interesting documents and artifacts that we have at Wall Builders. You know, at Wall Builders, we have the largest private collection of early American documents and artifacts. We have a museum, actually. It's outside of Fort Worth in Alito, Texas. And we have over 160,000 artifacts and documents from before 1812. And many of the documents that I use in and the quotations that I'm going to share with you today come from our own collection at Wall Builders. You know, rather than rely upon what the experts tell us, we go to the original sources. And that is more reliable than what an expert or a PhD may think. Why don't we just ask and hear from the actual founders of our nation? You know, every year, uh, we are one nation of uh, the United Nations has 193 sovereign states as of last year. And we're just one nation out of 193. But we're unique in so many ways. As a matter of fact, every single year, 4th of July, this we celebrate, uh, we set a record, actually, 233 years under one constitution. That is, goes from 1787 until today. And that was the date that we adopted the Constitution at the Constitutional Convention. 244 years under one Declaration of Independence. Uh, and we say that is the birthplace or the birth uh, day of our nation uh, every 4th of July. Uh, and every year we set a record. There has never been in the history of the world a longer lasting constitutional republic than the United States. And we have enjoyed in this country unparalleled degree of stability, prosperity, and creativity. Let me share a little bit with you. You know, we've had one government since 1787. France had 15. They had their revolution about the same time that we did. 
look at all these nations. Four in Russia, seven in Poland, nine in Nigeria, Afghanistan, six, Iraq, South Africa, Thailand, 17, China, four, just since 1954. And the average length of time for a constitution is 17 years. Uh, the median, that is one half of all nations above and one half below, the median is eight years. And yet we have lasted 233 nations, uh, 300, 233 years. Now that is a remarkable accomplishment. And it certainly is uh, unique in the history of the world and in the, and in the world today. You know, we comprise about 4% of the world's population. And every year, we have more inventions, more patents, more copyrights, more music, more literature published than the other 96% of the world's population. What a, a, a remarkable land that where creativity flourishes. Now, why is that? I'm going to try to answer those questions for you today. Let's look at just the prosperity. You know, we're 4% of the world's population, but every year, the United States of America generates over 25% of the world's gross domestic product. Unbelievable prosperity. And that is all unique. And it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm really not. These are just facts. These are not opinions. And I don't mean to say that we're a perfect nation. We have our flaws, but it's important to recognize, and I think there's been an imbalance in today's society about emphasizing our flaws versus our unique aspects. And that's why I wanted to share this with you. You know, this uh, subject matter is called American exceptionalism. Has anyone ever heard of, of that term before today? It's, it has been. Uh, in the political environment, uh, talking about whether uh, America really is exceptional or not. But from the statistics that I just shared with you, certainly when you measure stability, prosperity, and creativity, the United States stands out. So what made America so unique? As an attorney, I'm going to try to prove to you today and convince you that it is Holy Scriptures, the Bible, that is the basis and the foundation of our nation and what has yielded the unprecedented stability, creativity, and prosperity in our nation. Let me start just by talking about some idioms. Idioms are common everyday phrases that you hear. You know, there are over 257 idioms in the English language that just come from the King James Bible. Let me share some of those with you. By the skin of your teeth, two cents worth, a leopard can't change his spots, there's nothing new under the sun, sign of the signs of the times, thorn in the flesh, from the cradle to the grave, uh, handwriting is on the wall, and a fly in the ointment. I'm not going to do 257, but I'm going to do a few more. Eye for an eye, a house divided, fight the good fight, live by the sword, die by the sword, no rest for the wicked, let there be light, my cup runneth over, and uh, go the extra mile, and my favorite, the promised land. Now, you hear all those idioms. When I watch Fox News, I hear these every day in the commercials and in the television shows. They're common in everyday uh, language that we use uh, in English. But did you know that every single one of them comes from a scripture? Here they are. Job 19.20, Mark 12. I'm not going to read them all. But you see how every single one comes from a different scripture. And this tells you that in ages past, how pervasive the Bible was in our everyday society, that it became the actual language that we use in this nation. It is intermeshed with the Bible. 
in every aspect. That's the language. I'm also going to illustrate in law and in government how this is also true. Let's, you know, this was common knowledge to many of our uh, founding fathers. This is John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams. And listen to what he said. He said, with regard to the history contained in the Bible, it is not so much praiseworthy to be acquainted with it as it is shameful to be ignorant of it. Now, I disagree just a little bit with this. I think it's impressive when someone has knowledge of the Bible or they're, they're acquainted with it. I certainly uh, am impressed when someone knows uh, some of the uh, scriptures and even more impressed when they can quote them. Uh, but is it shameful to be ignorant of it? Well, let me say it in this, in this way. Let me compare. If I were to say, what's 2 plus 2? Everybody would say 4, of course, because that's common knowledge today. Well, to America's founding fathers, they used the Bible as their primary textbook when they learned to read and, of course, for instruction in morality and in virtue. So to them, it was an everyday thing. And so they were not only acquainted with it, but they said it would be shameful to be ignorant of it. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, one of our presidents, also put it like this. He said, the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our civic and social life that it would be impossible for us to figure what life would be if these teachings were removed. So what he's saying here is we can't even imagine not having uh, the freedom to worship or free speech or self-government, all the institutions that we somehow take for granted in this nation because they've always been. That's what he's saying. It's hard to imagine what life would be like without the Bible. And so it was very clear to many, many presidents, including his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt. Listen to what he said about the Bible. In the formative days of the Republic, the directing influence of the Bible exercised upon the fathers of the nation is conspicuously evident. And so to everyone, every one of our presidents, really up until the, the modern era, they all acknowledged the primacy of the Bible and what a significant part it played in the founding of America. Franklin Roosevelt went on to say, we cannot read the history of our rise and development as a nation without reckoning with the place the Bible has occupied in shaping the advances of the Republic. In other words, the Bible has been not only the foundation on which we build all of the freedoms that we now enjoy, the unprecedented stability, prosperity, and creativity that I talked about at the beginning. Benjamin Franklin, another one of our founding fathers, you know, Benjamin Franklin was probably the least religious of the founding fathers. And I say that with some measure. You know, right after I was appointed as judge, I had been a judge about 20 years. And uh, I went to a judicial conference for the whole state of Texas. And there were 250 judges there. And even I, having 20 years of legal knowledge, was the least knowledgeable about the law at that conference, I'm sure. So among our founding fathers, saying the least religious is not saying a lot that, that he didn't know the Bible because he was dedicated. You know, he was a publisher. That was one of his main professions. And he dedicated himself to publishing hymnals and sermons and books for all religions and all denominations, even Jewish hymnals. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin not only acknowledged the primacy of Scripture, but for, for as best we know, and we, we have one of his, uh, several of his letters here at Wall Builders, this letter that I'm going to tell you about was written to him just three months before he died. It was the president of Yale University, 
and Yale wanted to establish a honoring of the founding fathers. And he wrote to Benjamin Franklin, and he said, uh, Mr. Franklin, can you send us a portrait and perhaps uh, some artifacts, some of your papers? Uh, we'd like to create an archive here at Yale. And he wrote back and he said, you know what? All the paintings that I have of myself are fat and old. So, <laughs> so you know, but, but there's a new artist in town in Philadelphia, and I will try to get a new painting made and, and send that to you. But all the ones that I have right now are not suitable. And in the letter, the president of Yale goes on to say, and Mr. Franklin, I just wish to share with you my unending joy in knowing Christ. And I'd like to ask you where you stand, because in all of your writings, I've never heard you actually comment on this issue. Where do you stand as to Jesus Christ? This is three months before he died. He said, Benjamin Franklin said in the letter, you know, I have endeavored to follow Scripture and to live my life and be good to all men. And I acknowledge the primacy of Scripture, but I never have actually explored or come to a decision about the divinity of Christ. So he probably was not a Christian. I mean, there is a chance that in the last three months of his life, the Holy Spirit moved on him and uh, he came to know Christ. He says in this... Uh, letter with some uh, prophetic uh, vision that I will soon learn definitively on the question of the Lord's divinity. But here's the point, and the point is that the least religious founding father, who probably w w was not a Christian, uh, still acknowledged the primacy and the foundation set by Holy Scriptures. Here he is at the Constitutional Convention. I'm going to read you what was his longest speech. Now, don't, don't, don't be scared. It's only 14 sentences. He gave one of the longest speeches at the Constitutional Convention. You know, the Constitutional Convention was uh, there in 1787. They, they, they started in May. And for a month and a half, they got nowhere. They were deadlocked. In fact, the Constitutional Convention was going so bad that James Monroe and the delegation from Virginia was about to leave. And Washington, the chairman of the, of the convention, actually had to go out and chase them back into uh, the hall. Uh, they were about to give up because they were at odds. There, there was no unity. And so Benjamin Franklin got up and he gave this speech. I'm going to read it to you. In this situation, of this assembly, groping, as it were, in the dark to find political truth, and scarce able to distinguish it when presented to us, how has it happened, sir, that we have not once thought of humbly applying to the Father of Lights to illuminate our understanding? In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, when we we're sensible of danger. We had daily prayer in this very room for our divine protection. You know, they were meeting in the same room where the Declaration of Independence uh, was uh, adopted. And he remembered, probably because they were in the middle of the revolution, how they prayed every single day because there was a bounty on their heads. <laughs> oh God, please protect us. He says, uh, our prayers were indeed heard. Sorry and they were graciously answered. All of us engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend, or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. 
I firmly believe this. And I also believe, without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this building no better than the builders of Babel. And we shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers employing, imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. You know, this speech, he was by far the oldest delegate at the Constitutional Convention and commanded a lot of respect. And with this new speech, for all we know, it was extemporaneous. He was just speaking out of his general knowledge. And yet, this led, uh, those 14 sentences had actually 14 different scriptural quotes or references in them. Did you notice any 14? There were 14 sentences, so there's actually one in every single sentence. And so this, from a man that was not a believer, yet the Bible was so ingrained in him that speaking extemporaneously, he made 14 references to Scripture. Here they are. 14 different times. George Washington said, let's follow Ben Franklin's advice. Let's go down to the church down the street. And they took the weekend off and they gathered for prayer and for scriptural study and to hear sermons at the church down the street. The William, we know this because of William Rogers, the pastor who gave one of the sermons at this service. And you know what? It made all the difference in the world. When they came back to the Constitutional Convention on, on the following Monday, there was tremendous unity. Not only did the delegation from Virginia stay at the convention, but they actually proposed some of the basic uh, elements uh, of the government that was adopted in the Constitution. They had the Virginia Plan, which actually talked about uh, three different branches of government and how that would serve as the basis or the, the, the structure of the new Constitution. And so they knew scriptures. And did you know that these sections of the Constitution, Article 1, Section uh, 8, Article 2, Article 3, let me go back to that. These actually, from their own writings, the Founding Fathers told us that they derive these principles that they put into the Constitution directly from Scripture. Witnesses, uh, the president being a natural citizen was from Deuteronomy. Bills of attainder were directly from Ezekiel 18.20. Uh, here's, some, here, here's some other ones. The principle of separation of powers came from Jeremiah 17.9. John Adams wrote about that. The heart is desperately wicked. And so they knew that they couldn't concentrate power in one man because the heart is desperately wicked. My personal favorite is the three branches of government that come from Isaiah 33, 22, where it said, God is our king, our lawgiver, and our judge. Those three branches of government came from Isaiah 33, 22, and they put that directly into the Constitution. So you see... The Bible and the biblical principles of government are ingrained in our entire constitution, in our foundation of our government. And that is what has led to the unprecedented stability, prosperity, and creativity that we have in this nation. President Andrew Jackson acknowledged this and knew this. You know, he was uh, probably not a believer, although uh, we have uh, evidence that he converted to Christianity towards the end of his life. But most of his life he didn't uh, uh, follow Scripture. But even he acknowledged that the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. You know, in, in the Declaration of Independence in 1776, the founding fathers, the 56 men who signed this, among them were, there's Benjamin Franklin, there's Thomas Jefferson, there's John Adams, 
James Wilson, one of the founders of American law and founded the first law school at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. Here is Benjamin Rush, another founding father. You know, they acknowledged, in fact, that Richard Henry Lee, who's right there in the front row, he said, we actually copied John Locke's second treatise of government into the Declaration of Independence. And that's where we got the idea for the Declaration of Independence, directly from John Locke's second treatise on government. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the second treatise of government. He wrote it to rebut a pamphlet that had been published in England that talked about the divine right of kings and wanted to justify the divine right of kings throughout Scripture by uh, citing this principle and that principle. Uh, and, you know, it was very poor exegesis, very poor theology. He said, uh, for instance, um, Adam was the first king, and all of his sons were kings. So, something that is totally wrong. So John Locke knew Scripture and decided to explain to the public exactly how, no, it's government by the consent of the governed that is established in Scripture. And in this second treatise of government, he actually cites 1,500 Bible verses that apply to the principles of civil government. In the Constitution, we also have a very similar uh, evidence. This is very interesting because this book, The Origins of the American Constitutionalism, I've looked at this very book here at the, at the Wall Builders Library. These were actually a very dedicated and large group of American political scientists who decided to research exactly who the Founding Fathers quoted most often. Where did they derive, from what materials did they derive uh, their everyday uh, speaking, their publications, and of course uh, the principles that they incorporated into the Constitution itself. They, it took about 10 years to do this, and they compiled over 10,000 quotations. And in that uh, book, it talks about the most common uh, political philosopher that they quoted was Montesquieu. 8.3% of the quotes were Montesquieu. Montesquieu also talked about the three branches of government and separation of powers, and it's understandable why he would be one of the most commonly cited. Uh, the second most popular source of quotations was William Blackstone. Lord William Blackstone published uh, the common law and the commentary on the laws, and he was the second most quoted uh, source of quotations. The third was John Locke. Now, this was a 50-year period they did from 1776 all the way till about 1826. And what they found is, in the earlier part, around the Declaration of Independence, Locke was one of the most frequently quoted, but not as frequently quoted in the last uh, part of the 50 years. But compared to all these political philosophers, there was one source that was far and away the most common source. You know what that was? Scripture. The Bible was the source of over 34%, five times more than any other source. They relied on Holy Scripture and they quoted Scripture to justify all of their public publications and the basis of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. This was acknowledged in earlier times by a very famous president, Zachary Taylor hero of the, Span uh, of the Mexican War. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it. But Zachary Taylor was a president in the 1850s. He said this, The Bible is the best of books. I wish it were in the hands of everyone. It is indispensable to the safety and in the permanence of our institutions. Especially should the Bible be placed in the hands of the young, for it is the best school book in the world, and I would that all of our people were brought under the influence of that holy book. 
you know, let me go back up to the, to the first quote. You see, he says, the Bible is indispensable to the safety and the permanence of our institution. It is the bedrock upon which our institutions rest. And he acknowledged in this quote exactly how important Scripture was to him. Dr. Benjamin Rush, this is one of my favorite founding fathers. You know, he was, he was a doctor, uh, educated in Scotland. He uh, founded um, the first American Bible Society. He was an ardent abolitionist. He started the first abolition society in America and dedicated himself. He said, before I die, I will establish an abolition society in every single one of the 13 uh, states of America. Dr. Benjamin Rush was also known as the father of public schools under the Constitution. You know, he was so respected that he served in the administration of President George Washington, President John Adams, and President Thomas Jefferson. Three different times they relied on Benjamin Rush. During that period of time, he published several essays because even though that we didn't have widespread uh, public education at that time as we know it today, he thought it was important to have some uniformity. And he wrote these essays about how important it was to have a Bible in every single school. This is what he said. The Bible contains more knowledge necessary to man in his present state than any other book in the world. He's talking about the Bible not as a, not merely as a spiritual guide, but as a handbook to all of life. You see, the Founding Fathers believed that the Bible was relevant to every single area of life. This is a fascinating story. This is Matthew Maury. He was a ship's captain and served in the U.S. Navy during the 1800s. And he's known as the father of oceanography. He was recuperating from an illness and um, asked his daughter to read to him uh, as he was recuperating. And one day she read a scripture called Psalm 8.8. And in this scripture, he said, Thou madest man to have dominions over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. And he said to his daughter, wait a minute, read that last part again. He said, the paths of the sea. And he had an idea. And you know what? When he recuperated, he said, I'm going to look into that. And he researched it. And he's the one that actually came up with identifying the actual currents that are in this uh, diagram right here. He's the one who came up with the idea to track the uh, patterns and the flow of the oceans in the United States, all from Psalm 8.8. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, he's also considered the father of naval meteorology. And he also based that on another scripture from Ecclesiastes. Let me show you that one. Ecclesiastes 1.6 says, The winds go towards the south and turn around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. And he said circuit. That means circle. And he is also decided to look into that, and he's the one who first identified that there were jet streams that could predict the weather for ocean sailors. And isn't that impressive? All directly from Scripture. So he's the father of meteorology. John Adams, I think, is uh, certainly one of the most insightful of the founding fathers. You know, he was there at the beginning, at the Declaration of Independence, one of only six men to sign the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. But he's the only one who actually signed also the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. 
and another one. You know, I had the privilege of serving in the U.S. State Department. I did my internship. Uh, and on the eighth floor of the State Department building, uh, they have the actual Treaty of Paris, which was the treaty that concluded the American Revolution. And there, on that uh, treaty, is John Adams and uh, uh, signature. So he is one of the only ones who signed all four or five basic documents starting the United States. That's why I think he's one of the most uh, insightful of the Founding Fathers. He specifically talked about the constitutional separation of powers as being derived from Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is desperately wicked. Uh, and another founder of the American legal system, James Kent, he's uh, also known as one of the first scholars of the U.S. Constitution, published the first commentary on the Constitution. And he was appointed as a judge by George Washington. And he came up with the idea of using circuit judges. And you know what he wrote that he got where he got the idea? He said he got the idea from 1 Samuel 7, 15 and 16, where it talks about how Samuel actually rode the donkey from place to place to place to serve as a judge in the circuits of uh, ancient Israel. And he said that that's where he got the idea to have circuit judges. And to this day, the courts of appeal are called the circuits. Benjamin Franklin, also the founder of the first hospital in the United States, also there at, in Philadelphia, he said he got the idea of starting the first hospital directly from Luke 10, 35, which is the story of the Good Samaritan. And he incorporated this scripture into the seal of the hospital. It says, take care of him and I will repay thee. He said, you know, not everybody can render aid to their fellow man, but here it is, the principle of the Good Samaritan, where we can pay others to do the good works and to render aid to the sick and the fallen. You know, Alexander Hamilton, uh, first uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury and uh, a general who fought with uh, George Washington in the American Revolution, also served in the first two administrations of George Washington and John Adams. He said that the actual hand of God was involved in the founding of America. He cited Exodus 31.18, and you know this scripture actually talks about the finger of God actually coming down and writing the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets, the finger of God. Uh, he said that uh, James Madison wrote similarly. He said that the finger of God was actually involved in the framing of the U.S. Constitution. You know, this goes back uh, to ancient Egypt, of course. Uh, the story of Exodus, of course, is Moses confronting Pharaoh and asking him to set free, demanding that he set free the, the children of Israel. And of course, to prove his uh, power, God sent ten plagues to try to convince uh, the Pharaoh to do that. You know, the first two plagues were the blood and the frogs. And the Bible says that the magicians in Egypt could replicate the first two miracles. They could turn water into blood, or at least it looked like blood. And they could make frogs appear. But when it got to the third one, lice, um, which is also translated as gnats, the magicians in Egypt said, we don't know how they're doing this. There's no way that we can uh, create this plague of lice, much less flies and other pestilence. And it says that, here's this, the, the actual scripture, it said, all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. And then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. That concept of the finger of God comes throughout Scripture. It also, uh, 1831 uh, is the Scripture that says that God wrote the Ten Commandments 
with his very finger on the stone tablets. Uh, here it is. And he gave unto Moses when he had made the end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. This concept of the finger of God, uh, as I said, is throughout Scripture. In the book of Daniel, um, during uh, one of the feasts of Belshazzar, I guess, uh, the king there, it says uh, that, the, actually, you know, I read this Scripture in preparing for this presentation. They were partying, he said, with thousands of his princes, and they were drinking wine. And he said, you know what? Didn't we recover some golden chalices when we raided Jerusalem? So why don't you bring those golden chalices from the Jerusalem temple, and let's drink wine out of those golden chalices. Well, the Lord was highly offended by that. And that's when the finger of God actually wrote many, many tekel ufars, ufarsin. Is that how you say that? And I looked that up. And to give you another popular reference, the word tekel is, uh, actually means, you have been weighed in the balance, O king, and found wanting. Which, which is also a quote from the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think, from Indiana Jones and the, and the Last Crusade. Remember when uh, the, uh, the knight drinks from the wrong chalice and he says, you've been found wanting. <laughs> That's directly from that scripture, Daniel 5.25. Jesus also referred to the finger of God. He said uh, when the Pharisees uh, confronted him about casting out demons and they said, you do it by the power of Beelzebub, he said, but if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is upon you. This concept of the finger of God appears throughout Scripture. And it's used to, of course, represent a miracle or the power and the authority of God that could not be man-made. And yet the Founding Fathers acknowledged that in the writing of the Constitution. Here's Alexander Hamilton's quote. He said, For my own part, I sincerely esteem the Constitution, a system with, without the finger of God never could have been suggested and agreed upon by such a diversity of interests. The finger of God. Uh, James Madison said the same thing when he wrote this. The real wonder is that the Constitutional Convention overcame so many difficulties and to overcome them with so much agreement as was unprecedented as it was unexpected. It is impossible for the pious man not to recognize in it the finger of that almighty hand which was so frequently extended to us in the critical stages of the revolution the finger of the almighty hand of God. Even the president of the Constitutional Convention, George Washington, remarked that it had to be the finger of God that led to the establishment of the Constitution. As to my sent sentiments with respect to the new Constitution, George Washington wrote, it appears to me little short of a miracle. It demonstrates as visibly as the finger of providence as any possible event in the course of human affairs can ever designate it. Of course, he references the finger of God. Now, some say he, he, he used the word providence instead of God, but George Whitfield, one of the most uh, prominent preachers of the First Great Awakening, actually used to refer to God in his sermons as God's providence. President John Quincy Adams, this will be one of the, the last uh, founding fathers that I want to share with you. You know, he was a remarkable man. He, at the age of 14, was appointed as a special delegate to the court of Russia because he was one of the only diplomats in the U.S. State Department that could speak six different languages at the age of 14. Um, he wrote this, uh, uh, and, and he traveled so much as a diplomat. He, uh, George Washington called him the greatest diplomat of the United States. Uh, he traveled so much that he was apart from his son. By the way, he named his son George Washington Adams. Uh, and so we have a, a lot of his letters and his journals. And listen to what he wrote to his son about studying the Bible. He said, no book in the world deserves to be so unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated upon as the Bible. 
I have myself for many years made it my practice to read through the Bible once every year. My custom is to read four or five chapters every morning, immediately after rising from my bed. It employs about an hour of my time and seems to be the most suitable manner for the beginning of the day. Now, why would it take an hour to read four or five chapters of Scripture? You know, we have some of his journals, and he would actually compare the, the French translation to the Latin translation to the English translation of Scripture, and he would actually compare them. That's how uh, devoted to reading Scripture he was, and that's what he wanted to tell his son. These, these journals that he wrote to his son are, are very touching. I have always endeavored to read it with the same spirit which I now recommend to you. That is, with the intention and desire that it may contribute to my advance in wisdom and in virtue. Wisdom is how you think. Virtue is how you behave. One of the clearest examples that we have from the Founding Fathers of how they viewed Scripture. They viewed it not only as a spiritual guide, but as a guide for everyday life and for a guide in behavior. You know, um, it is no doubt that the Founding Fathers looked to the Bible for the basis of the American Constitution and as the basis for everyday life. And, you know, this is how history used to be taught. It used to be taught with a view of how God is interacting with men. And I used to think history was dry before I, uh, actually, I, I loved studying uh, God's influence in, in, in history and in Scripture before I was with wall builders. But since I've been with wall builders, the biblical view of history is how God is advancing His liberty through man. and. It presents, this is a brand new publication from Wall Builders, and it adopts this providential view of history. That is, to share not only the good and the bad, but also the ugly, because we're not a perfect nation, but we have the basis of Scripture as the foundation of our whole entire government. And this tells the story of the first hundred years of America. It's just being published, the beginnings, it goes up to 1876. And it takes this adoption, uh, this, this view of a providential view of history. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, some of the uh, material from Wall Builders. You can follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. And uh, the, the Wall Builders website is chocked full. It's as close as, as, as your phone or as, as the Internet. And there is a wealth of information. If you think I went too fast, I'm not quite as fast as the Bartons, but uh, <laughs> they, they speak at incredibly fast rates. Uh, I'm much slower. But I'll tell you, I'm sure that I shared with you more than you can absorb in this short period of time. And please go to wallbuilders.com or one of the Facebook or Instagram sites and look at the rich amount of resources we have for all Christians, so that you can realize exactly how important Scripture is. Let me leave you with this parting Scripture. And, you know, we live by this at Wall Builders. We uh, endeavor to always encourage people to read the Scriptures every single day. And this Scripture is one of the ones uh, that I depend on the most. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, it says in Joshua 1.8, But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt, I'm sorry, for then thou shalt make thy way, this is King James, <laughs> for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now who doesn't want to prosper and have success in their life? And here it is in Joshua 1.8. The key to be prosperous in your life and to have good success in your endeavors is to study Scripture and read it every day. Meditate on it day and night. Well, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Sean.
for this opportunity to share with you all. Thank you, Judge Diaz. That is uh, the first of three presentations. We'll have a different one going on in just a few minutes. So those of you that are online, we will be back at 1030 for our, our uh, regular Sunday morning worship service. And Judge Diaz will present uh, session number two. And then this evening, we will do session number three, and that'll be at 6 p.m. So please be aware of that, and please join us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. You've given us the Bible. And the Bible applies to every area of our life not just the spiritual aspects. Because God, you created us. You created all things. And Lord, thank you for Judge Diaz and just being able to bring out and show us the history um, and how the Bible affected um, this gentleman, Maury, with, with science and navigation. It was part of the founding of our country, the foundation of our country. So thank you, Lord, for teaching us this. Lord, would you prepare our hearts to worship you as we continue with our Sunday morning service. Lord, thank you for your word and your son, Jesus. Amen. See you at 1030.